Lord, are you going to restore the rule to Israel now? His answer was, the exact time is not yours to know. The Father has reserved that to himself. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes down on you. Then you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, yes, even to the ends of the earth. No sooner had he said this than he was lifted up before their eyes in a cloud, which took him from their sight. Uh, St. Matthew describes this moment a little bit differently, but it's, it's very much the same, the same message. Uh, in the 28th chapter of St. Matthew, the 11 disciples made their way to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had summoned them. At the sight of him, those who entertained doubts fell down in homage. Jesus came forward and addressed them in these words. Full authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you and know that I am with you always until the end of the world. So the church begins with the disciples receiving uh, a, a commission from Jesus, really being given a, a, a mission. And that is to be witnesses to the gospel to, to the ends of, of, of the earth. Uh, this witnessing we know is gonna go on a long time. Uh, in fact, Jesus tells us that he's going to be with us until the end of the world. Uh, he'll be with us always. So we, we are to conclude <laughs> that the mission that he has given to his disciples uh, in the church will go on uh, and on and on until the Lord, uh, Lord comes again. So it, it, uh, it is the, the mission that it is uh, given and received um, by disciples, given by Jesus, received by disciples in every, in every age and, and, and in every place. Uh, you and I have uh, received this commission from Jesus through baptism. Uh, he's invited us to be his disciples and his friends, and he renews now in our time uh, and in our place this uh, great commission uh, that he gave to the first disciples, but that really is the, it's entrusted to the church, uh, to disciples in, in, in every age. Um, a, a gospel, the good news of uh, God's plan for our salvation in Jesus Christ, it, it just kind of cries out to be preached. Uh, it, it's not meant to be a, a, a dead letter, uh, not meant to be something that's just in, in, in a book where we can go look it up every so often, uh, but the gospel is, is a living uh, proclamation entrusted to the disciples of Jesus uh, to, to be shared, uh, shared by preaching, but particularly by, by uh, witnessing uh, on the part of those who have come to know Jesus, who acknowledge him as Lord, and who want to share the light and the joy of, of his gospel, uh, the, the saving plan of our Heavenly Father in Jesus uh, with uh, as many people as, uh, as, as possible. So in, uh, as we uh, reflect on the, the theme of today's uh, gathering, uh, we realize that this is the time that uh, God has put us here in, in the world. This is the time he has uh, given us to live in the human uh, this is the time he has called us to be his sons and daughters uh, and adopted us in baptism. Uh, Jesus claims us as his own uh, people and uh, uh, thinks so much of us, we might say, uh, that he gives us the privilege of, of sharing in his saving mission and, and proclaiming it in word, uh, but especially in, in deed in our own time. It's interesting that uh, 25 years ago when St. John Paul II wrote uh, his powerful encyclical, Evangelium Vitae, The Gospel of Life, uh, that he chose this idea of a gospel uh, to, to present uh, the church's pro-life uh, teaching and understanding in such a, a, a powerful and, and, and cogent way. Uh, he, he, I think, gave this uh, title to, to this important teaching because he wanted us to think of it as a gospel. <laughs> to think of our pro-life understanding, our pro-life teaching, our pro-life work uh, as, as essentially a gospel, something that needs to be articulated, something that sort of cries out uh, for, uh, for witnesses. It's not a new gospel, of course. Uh, St. John Paul wasn't adding to the canon of scripture uh, and, and it's not a, a, a twist 
either on the on the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. But the, um, the Holy Father, St. John Paul, highlighted uh, really what's at the heart uh, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but highlighted it for our time, sort of held it up as both a challenge and a, a privilege and opportunity for us. Um, because we know, and he reminds us at the very beginning of, of this encyclical, uh, that uh, the Son of God became man. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God, also the Son of Mary. So human dignity is really at the heart of the good news of God's saving plan for us. Uh, right from the beginning, it's right at the heart of the gospel in, in, in every page, in every, in every aspect. Uh, Jesus meant for uh, his first disciples to take the commission, the mission he was giving them, he, he intended for them to take that personally. So he, he didn't uh, just commission them to go hand out copies of the gospel to, to people. Uh, he didn't say, I'm gonna put together an organization and you can cheer for it from the, from the sidelines so that, that it carries out the work that I, uh, that I have um, uh, begun and, and that is secured by the power of my death and resurrection. But no, Jesus uh, intended uh, that each uh, of his disciples, every baptized person would share in his saving mission. He intended those disciples, he intends for you and me to take this commission personally and, and to believe that he is sending us now in our time, the place where we find ourselves uh, to uh, witness our belief in him as, as our Lord and Savior, but also to share in, in, in his mission, which is, is a mission of, of redemption, a mission of mercy. He wants to, us to do that, that personally. So I'd encourage us as we begin this, this time together to recall the, the rhythm of, of discipleship, those who are entrusted with the work of the gospel. Jesus invites us, his disciples, first to come close to him. Uh, to get to know him in a very personal way. Uh, he wants us not just to know about him, not just know what he did a long time ago, but to experience his powerful action in our lives right now. Uh, we do that through prayer, through adoration, spending time with him. We know that the Lord wants us to have a deeper relationship with him than the one we have so far. There's always more that, that he's offering us, more that we can experience. Uh, in allowing ourselves to be drawn close to Jesus in such a personal way, uh, we allow the Lord then to equip us uh, to do what he's asking of us. He asks us to come close to him first, but then uh, with every disciple, he sends us out. Um, he sends us out to have an influence as just we can with our own personalities, with our own pluses and minuses. The Lord knows us. He calls us to be his disciples, asks us not to be afraid. He uh, reminds us that he, that he himself is with us, but he wants us to, uh, to act and to act in some, some practical ways. So at the beginning of this day, we invite the Lord to be with us and we pray that we can be close to him as we think and, and reflect uh, together on, on uh, this important gospel of, of life. But we also pray that he will reveal to us in a, a new way, perhaps uh, uh, during uh, these, these hours together, uh, how he desires us to, to, go, to put ourselves a little more personally on the line for the gospel of life. Uh, to look around and, and see who are the, the, the persons close to us that we might be able to influence. Uh, to influence, uh, not so much to make them do something, uh, but to influence them to take a step in the direction of Jesus so that they too might um, uh, feel the, the warmth of his love and the, the, the depth of his mercy so that they too might then uh, accept the invitation uh, to become his, his witnesses. And we are thinking about the election. It's, an, it's important, an important moment in our country and in our state, but it's a moment. Uh, and we can have a certain influence uh, by our vote and by encouraging others to vote. I hope that we do, do those things uh, prayerfully and, and, and faithfully. Uh, but the, uh, the witnessing needs to go on in the time after the election and, and then the, the, months, the months after that. Uh, we uh, approach this all not uh, as a burden, and not as a, some daunting task, but as a, a, a commission that Jesus himself has, has given to us. So if he's, if he's asking us to do something, he's giving us the grace to do it. And if we uh, approach him in prayer, he'll reveal to us how, how we can uh, do it effectively, be effective witnesses to the, to the gospel of, of, um, of Jesus Christ. Let me close then with a, with a brief prayer and, and a blessing for our day. Let us pray. God, our loving Father, Grant wisdom to those who govern us, compassion and courage to those who work to defend human life, and safety and care to every human person. For you al alone, who formed us in our mother's wombs, and who call us home to heaven, 
our God, forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you for this morning and remain with you forever. Amen. Lauren, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Archbishop, for that very beautiful reflection. Um, you know, with the feast day of John Paul II that we celebrated earlier this week, he's just such a great reminder that, you know, Jesus is the answer for everything and we need to be close to him and let, let him draw us close to him. So that was a great reminder that as we move forward and look at how we can redeem the times, um, Jesus is the answer for that. So thank you so much, Archbishop, for that reflection and that blessing. I feel good. We're going to go on with this conference. It's going to be a great day and the Huskers are going to win. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we'll just go on and start our panel discussion. So the topic for this panel discussion is we are the times and that was inspired by a quote from St. Augustine of Hippo, which is, uh, which I'll read bad times, hard times. This is what people keep saying but let us live well and time shall be good. We are the times, such as we are, such are the times. And we thought this was such a good um, reminder that how we live our lives is going to change the culture around us. And so we wanted to dive in and, and understand why is the culture the way that it is? There's always a reason for it. Um, and we also want to give solution. So how can Catholics, how can the church live better to change the times that we're in? And so we invited three experts um, in the pro-life movement and three, you know, really profound witnesses that are living, living what they preach right now. Um, so we're excited to welcome Bishop Joseph Hannafelt, who is the Bishop of Grand Island, Nebraska. Um, we are also welcoming Christina Barba Whalen, who is the director and found, helped found the Culture Project, um, which has provided a formative mission experience to 74 missionaries, has served in 62 dioceses, and empowered nearly 200,000 youth by proclaiming the dignity of the human person and the richness of living sexual integrity thereby inviting our culture to be fully alive. They have a really great mission and I have experienced those awesome missionaries and programs firsthand. So we're really excited to have Christina with us. And then lastly, we are welcoming Kevin Grillio, who's the executive director of a group called We Dignify. And they work to transform college students into skilled, virtuous pro-life leaders. Um, Kevin has mentored hundreds and served thousands to change hearts and minds on campus. They also work to organize the March for Life in Chicago. Um, and in the last eight years, that march has grown from 150 people to 9,000 people. So he is definitely leading a great witness in Chicago. So we are excited to welcome all of these panelists um, this morning. So we're just gonna start off talking about why is the culture the way that it is? What is going on right now? And we'll start with you, Bishop Hannafel. In your perspective, give us, a, give us a diagnosis. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could tune in today. <clears throat> There's a lot of markers, I suppose, you could look at that has gotten us um, culturally where we are today. But from a spiritual perspective, I'd like to just go back to the first commandment. I am the Lord your God, you shall not have other gods besides me. And ever since the fall of man, we've had other gods besides the Lord. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the sixth chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, begins this section by saying, you cannot serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other or serve one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And if you think about the, the challenges of the world today, it's to, to be prosperous, to get ahead, to be successful, often measured in worldly, um, worldly terms. And I, I really believe that the challenge of that passage that goes on is to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else we need will be, will be provided for us as well. So I think part of the, the, the reason why we're in the situation we're in is because gradually we've lost sight of this uh, sovereignty of God, as I often call it. And when we lost sight of the sovereignty of God, um, then we're left with ourselves. And so without this, we're simply on our own. And when you think about being on your own, orphaned, if you will, um, under the guise of freedom to do what I want, 
it's a kind of hellishness, really. We have to simply manage our own happiness. And then the idea of every day finding security in being able to manage our own happiness. In other words, we don't look to God for it. We don't look at in terms of the satisfaction of self-service. We simply think self-centeredly about everything. And, uh, and gradually this begins to take over. And that has now progressed to a disdain and a hatred, especially for religion. Religion is something that always points out of ourselves, back to the Lord, points to our neighbor. The Good Samaritan is a good example. And so I think when you don't have faith as a foundation, and again, you could look at all the markers in our culture that have brought us to the why we don't have faith in our culture um, or why it's diminished so much. I think it's because uh, it is contrary to this distorted notion of freedom. And the idea of freedom to do what I want versus the freedom to put my life at the service of others. And uh, I believe that in one way, that's a way of diagnosing what's going on in our culture. Taking away God's sovereignty, ending up being so, so independent that we have to manage our own happiness every day, which means we almost have to step on others, we think, to get to where we want to be. And uh, it's really backwards. It's really inverted. It's really opposite of how God created us to be. So I won't go on, but I'll say that as a start, so. Great, thank you. Um, Christina, we're going to you, same question. Okay, hello everyone, good morning. Great to be with you all. Um, I couldn't agree more with Bishop's remarks. Um, I guess just a, a, a more simplified uh, version of, of that or just a perspective that I see of the state of our culture um, there's no convincing. We don't, no one here needs convincing that we've got issues and there are things going on. Um, at the end of the day, simply put, I just feel that we have forgotten who we are and who we belong to. Um, and again, that's a, another simplified version of what you've just said, Bishop, but that, you know, we were created by a creator in his image and likeness. Um, I just think we've forgotten who we are and who we belong to and what we're made for. Um, as at a young age, just personally, I became really uh, an, a, an activist because of the abortion issue. I just couldn't understand this, this, how unjust this issue was, that these little babies' lives were being taken and whatnot. And so from a young age, I saw a part of the big problem of our world today that we're living in, this culture of death, really as, as abortion. As I went to kind of get involved in that and see like, how can we, how can we combat this? How are we so off as a society that we're okay with this? Um, the more I kind of got involved in that, then I started to think of and to look and to reflect and to pray and be like, wow, what's at the root of this? You know, and then going deeper to see like, oh, well, we have a real problem with sexuality. Like we're not understanding how to live out our sexuality properly. We have a distorted vision of this. And with lack of chastity, then that brings us to this you know, side effect, side effect of abortion. And then after spending like over a decade really working on promoting the virtue of chastity and all of that, I've come to the, come further along in the conclusion that really the root of all of that is that we've forgotten our identity. We've, we have an identity problem. So we no longer understand what it means to be man, what it means to be woman, what it means to be human. Um, and we forget, we've forgotten who we are and that we belong together and to God. So that's my, my, my quick synopsis. I know we'll, we'll go a little further into all of this. Great, thank you. Yes, we will explore further into some of these points you're bringing up. All right, Kevin, what is going on in our culture? Well, they, if they figure out the identity and the sexuality, then I think my work on the abortion end is gonna resolve itself. So if you guys could figure those two pieces out and then the outgrowth would be wonderful, but I think uh, we're, we're right in stride together with that understanding. I think when we separate God from this concept and, and put a divide between faith and reason, people started prioritizing science above all things and physical science, not metaphysics, and took that out of the picture. And so if you just hang out with physics, that provides you facts or data, but it doesn't provide you value. And the void of value, then it's left to how do you determine, and each person is determining value. When you break that down, it's really led to a lot of desire-based valuations and, and has moved out intellect. So now the will is being shaped by the desire. And that has very short-term side with feeling-based decisions and, and really has where you see the marrying of feelings and identity together because identity has been taken out. And if you're making decisions based just on feelings, 
and that's who you are. So you hear the expressions of, well, you disagree with me, so you hate me, or that kind of reaction and guttural response is based out of not understanding who we are, but also having a hard understanding of if you're moving intellect out of the picture. So I just wanted to add into that. So if we could move away from the Burger King mindset of have it your way and start understanding that your way is not, we are not meant to be separated, but the Trinity is actually an example of love is based in relational being. So returning back to that community is, is going to be integral on where we go forward. Great, thank you. It's so important to understand, you know, the root of the problems that we see, because I think it's really easy for Catholics and Christians to say, why can't people just see that killing a baby in the womb is evil, is wrong? Or why can't people just see that marriage should be between a man and a woman? Or, you know, there's so many things that we can get frustrated by, but it's important for us to understand the root of the problem. And then, of course, how it ripples through the culture. So that's something I want to explore next is, you know, coming down to this base problem, what do we see as an effect of it? What's the domino effect of some of these issues? So Bishop Hannafelt, um, a distorted view of the human person, not knowing our, not having an, our identity in Christ and understanding we're made in his image and likeness. What kind of ripple effect does that have through our culture? But you know that we're created in the image and likeness of God. And I, I scarcely believe we even understand that or we get a full sense of it until we're in the kingdom. But if we're created in the image and likeness of God, then there's a dignity about who we are. And and God is love, of course, so that in a sense, we ought to be living out of this, um, this posture of being so filled with God's love. And we ought to be living out of this place where um, we extend what we've received, God's love for us, born out in our love for our neighbor. Well, that isn't there as a foundation. The, the ripple effect isn't love, but it's um, a harshness, you might say. For, now, now I say, that, as I said earlier, freedom is the, the pursuit of what I want, and then the harshness comes that I'm going to do what I'm going to need to do to get what I want. The effect, uh, I think, that comes out in our culture in such a way that, that uh, literally, to get what I want, I may have to uh, step on your rights, so to speak, because mine are superior, mine are uh, paramount, mine are what really matters. So there isn't a sense of the other as a equal, you might say, in dignity, but rather there's a sense of other exists for my uh, happiness, whatever I determine that happiness to be. The human person's existence then becomes a kind of radical individualism, that it's all about me. No one can tell me anything, but nor can I uh, be appreciated. Only I know me, and therefore only I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. It, it just extends all kinds of things that others exist basically to please me or to make my life go as best as it can. Other people have no inherent dignity, therefore, and the, the effect is that they're dispensable, whether it's in abortion or any other kind of way in which, even especially in social media, we distance each other or write people off or condemn each other, uh, how, how nasty social media has become and all those kinds of things. Because they have no dig dignity, they in fact are often a detriment to me. And so anything, and we see this just in how people look at a larger families. After three children, it's expected that you would, you know, uh, sterilize yourself. It's the sense that, that why would you want to live in a way that might in some way impact me in a negative way? It becomes like everything's about me, everything revolves around me. Uh, it's a kind of uh, experience in our culture. So I think this then becomes a very lonely, very isolated, and a very angry existence. Uh, and we're witnessing this in, in the anarchy, and I think in the violence that's taking place in cities across this country, that the, the, it's reaching up in this kind of a boiling point where it's spilling over into the world around us. The, the effects then of a distorted view of the human person is, is uh, the logical conclusion is much of what we're seeing in our culture today. Absolutely. And I think that selfishness um, is going to translate to our next topic <laughs> of human sexuality and how a distorted view of human sexuality ripples through our culture too. And Christina, I know the Culture Project, that's one of their main points of formation is teaching kids about what 
how beautiful our bodies are, what they're made for and what they're not made for. Um, I'm just gonna do a little plug on Facebook and Instagram. If you follow the Culture Project, there's so many great videos that help, especially young people understand this. So um, that's your quick plug. But Christina, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how our distorted view of human sexuality ripples through the culture. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for that plug. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think, you know, a distorted view of sexuality has ripple effects on all aspects of society. Um, sexuality is a really, really powerful thing. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing, but it's, it's powerful and it can be abused and it can be um, properly lived out in a certain context. Um, and so basically, you know, I think um, we've maybe seen this as too much of a, like one way or another, like it's like a, an, an oppression or like, you know, an indulgence. Um, but really at the end of the day, the church has so many beautiful, beautiful things to say about human sexuality and so many wonderful things to teach us. I know when I had my light bulb moment and kind of like that aha, like, oh, oh, the church, she knows what she's talking about. Like really living a life of chastity, not even like abstinence, like chastity, this like deep integration of my sexuality, not this negative thing like that sex is bad or evil but just realizing that the church she never teaches that she hasn't taught that that the sexuality is a beautiful beautiful thing that's really really powerful and because it's so beautiful and powerful it needs to be safeguarded and it needs to be cherished um, and that's really what the virtue of chastity is it's this opportunity for us to integrate this beautiful gift of our sexuality, not to reject it, not to reject our sexual passions or desires, but to, to feel them because you're human and alive. It's good if you have those things, um, but then to take them and to channel them. And I guess I just see chastity as safeguarding love. Um, it like helps us to funnel this passion into something that's really, really beautiful. I think our culture has like super over-sexualized everything. It's over-sexualized love, friendship, everything. Um, and we're just at a loss. We're suffering because of that. And I think we think like you can't have love if you even want to go to believe in love, because there are many people who don't even believe in love anymore. Again, one of the ripple effects, I think, of this abuse of our sexuality and our not knowing who we are. But linking love so intimately with sexual expression, like intimate sexual expression, and missing the whole point that, gosh, without love, without love, all of us would die. You know, we were created from the author of love and we're all made for love. And, you know, the, the catechism of the Catholic church, I, I love this, says that the innate and fundamental vocation of every human person is to love. So it's not like um, this is something that is just for a few chosen people. Um, love is something that every human heart longs for, needs, and desires, and that God wants us to live it out. And that our sexuality isn't like cut off from love, that it's a beautiful part of it. But again, the way that we can actually um, harness the power of our sexuality is chastity. And again, that's it's something for everybody. Every single human person is made for love, called for love, and is also called to live chastity. And it's called to learn to master these desires to integrate them, to make us free in order to have beautiful, loving friendships, to really love one another, to be open to that. And then if, if the Lord wills for us to have the opportunity to have that expression in a romantic relationship, but it all starts with, with mastering first our passions and our desires that then frees us to actually love. It gives us the opportunity to actually put someone ahead of ourselves. And again, without love, we'd all be crippled and die. Without the, the possibility of getting to share ourselves and, and put someone ahead of ourselves, life would be completely meaningless. So I think as we've distorted this vision of sexuality, we've lost hope in a lot of these things. We've lost hope in marriage. We've lost hope in love. Um, you know, we, you know, marriage is the backbone of our society and it's just kind of demolished because of this lack of sexuality. And even if you happen to come from a home in which, you know, you got to see marriage lived out beautifully, you're so few and far between. When you look at the culture around and those around you, there's not the stability that used to be there. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap up here, but I have another point that one of my early years of doing missionary work and forming young adults, particularly in these virtues, one of my missionaries said something to me along the lines of like, well, but you know, divorce has taught us that like you can do something to get kicked out of a family. And I hadn't thought of it that way before, but we have this whole group of young men and women that have lived and grown up thinking that 
their family isn't stable and that you can be maybe kicked out of your family. And I just, gosh, so anyway, the consequences of that insecurity, I mean, that has so many, so many ripple effects. So anyway, just, just a few points on that. I know I'm kind of going over here, so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll cut myself off, but the implications of all of this, the ramifications are devastating and uh, affect all aspects of life, but there's hope and we'll talk about the hope soon. Yes. Thank you, Christina. You know, that brings up a good point about, you know, people coming from broken families or having those wounds and how, you know, sometimes that's what drives their worldview. That's what drives their actions. I know we'll maybe explore that a little bit later. Before we move on to Kevin, I just want to remind everybody, if you have questions for the panel, you can type them into at the bottom. There's little bubbles that say Q&A, or maybe it looks like a chat box if you want to send me any questions that we can um, send over to the panel once we finish with the, the questions we've already written. If you have any thoughts, please type them in. So Kevin, um, you work specifically too with helping raise up pro-life leaders working in the March for Life. So abortion, I mean, we're all thinking about abortion and trying to make it unthinkable and illegal and all of those things. But um, in your perspective, what what does abortion and you know the culture of death, what ripple effects does that have in our society? What can we see from that? It's one of those things that where you talk about abstractly or conceptually and then it intrudes and breaks into when we try and disconnect reality with, with values and principles and truth, it is a huge shattering of that. Because people go into it thinking, I desire, I have to pick my future above my presence or above my child. And when you make that distinction, then an abortion occurs and it, this is not what I expected. This is not what I felt. This is not why people left me alone and isolated. And it totally shatters an understanding. And I think the, that's when you have an intrusion of, of the experience not resulting in the desired outcome. And... It, because then no longer can you distinction, the distinction doesn't exist between, oh, just how I feel is what can shape me and that can make me better long-term versus there are specific objective truths in the world that can really give you a deeper joy than the, the fleeting happiness. So we see abortion, at, I mean, it, it brings into light very much the destruction of the family. At the root of that, it is often leaving people worse off than where they were at each and every time. But they're, the isolation, either from their identity in God, their, the isolation from their family, has left them stranded. Someone recently, one of the students I worked with, and um, she was reflecting on her time in college, and she mentioned one of the significant factors when she got pregnant that led her, her boy, boyfriend at the time said, well, whatever you choose, I'll support. And when she was reflecting back on that, she realized that that wasn't like a nice thing or it's many people think, Oh, that's a nice thing to say to someone because then it's just theirs. But that wall that he put up, she said, then not only was it my choice, it was my responsibility and he wasn't involved at all. And that disconnect from the relational end led her. It was one of the factors that let her have an abortion. And that has dramatically shaped the trajectory of her life as well as obviously her child's. So I think that these phrases that a lot of people think it, is helping. Oh, I don't want to offend you with expressing my beliefs. Well, the idea that that was inward facing of my beliefs, they're just mine. I possess them. They're not for you. They're not for the world. They're not to better you. Uh, that distinction that has developed. And I, the other, another component with it that is important to remember as you're working with younger people, for those who are, because abortion has been around for so long, for decades, Every person I work with and that we, we dignify works with and serves has been born into a world where this is just how it is. And so looking backwards and saying, and I remember a time when this, that doesn't help because their worldview has been shaped by what currently exists. And if the only thing that we provide them is let's try and destroy what currently exists, that's just playing whack-a-mole on the problems of evil, but not giving any future not any vision, or not any place where we can move. Yes, they know well that we're here. They're learning each and every time a desire doesn't work out and it hurts them deeper than just what they expected to be, bring them happiness and they try to fill that void a different way. 
they learn that, that this is not working. But the opportunity that they need is to be connected to a vision of what are we building? Where is the world going? How can we create values and reconnect them not from experiential learning solely to make their decisions about opinions and values, but connect them back into seeing how to build a culture of life, the vision God gives, and the values that come about. And we elevate them from just experiential to values, then it can shape the trajectory of where we're headed. Thanks, Kevin. I think you bring up a good point, you know, talking about whack-a-mole and um, sometimes the things that we might do as well-meaning people of the church, well-meaning pro-lifers who, you know, want to spread the message. We want less babies to perish. We want women to feel safe and taken care of. But, you know, there's things that we do that aren't super helpful sometimes in the pro-life movement and just in evangelization. So, yeah, that, that's the next question for you all. What are some things that, well mean, again, well-meaning people like ourselves can do that might hurt the pro-life or, you know, just the message of the church in general? And then what, alternatively, what can we be doing to better engage the culture where it is and redeem the time? So, Bishop Hannafelt. Yeah, when I thought about this question, I thought, first of all, we shouldn't be withdrawing from the world. Uh, saying it's all gone off in a, and so we're just going to live in our little enclave and hide out, you might say, or to some ways just try and manage, cope uh, in isolation with a few people who agree with us type of a thing. Um, also, I don't think we should be silent on matters of injustice. We need to call out injustice. We need to be a voice, uh, be perhaps a prophetic voice in our culture that says this is not the way uh, the human person is dignified or should live. And when we find these kinds of things that happen, not just with abortion, but truly anything that is below the dignity of the human person, we need to say, I disagree with that. And of course, in some way we might get shamed for it, but the fact is we need to be that voice. Rather than withdraw and rather than be silent, I think we need to be that voice. And I think we also have to, uh, um, what is it, bulk up, you might say, on our ability to suffer. Uh, we have to really be willing to, sit, to take it. To, to, to endure it, to, to recognize it, there's a price for our, our um, faith and to live our faith that's going to have some consequences that will perhaps be difficult or challenging. On the other hand, I think, first of all, that one of the things we need to do is just simply be more, as a church, engaged in prayer and self-denial. It's part of the, the boot camp training and suffering, I think, that has to happen. We're very soft. I mean, I mean, I'm into my 60s now, and I didn't grow up in a very fancy uh, world, but I've lived a comfortable life. And self-denial and penance just helps us begin to take on and take strength from the Lord instead of relying on ourselves. I also think we should be joyful witnesses to life in Christ in a culture that doesn't see a lot of joy, that we need to be really content with living the gospel, uh, living with Christ as the cause of our joy, and not simply finding it in the material world. Uh, being a witness, therefore. I think we have to tell the story of, uh, of our redemption. Uh, the guy created the world. And there was original sin. And he sent Jesus as our Savior. And then he not only rose from the dead, but he sent his Holy Spirit to animate us and keep us going, you might say. And so I think we have to tell the story of redemption. What is the cause of our hope, as St. As Paul often says? We should share our faith, not hide it. I think in symbols, whether it's you know wearing a cross or an image of a saint in our cubicle at work, whatever it might be, we should share our faith um, in words, saying things like "God bless you" or "How can I pray for you," and not being afraid to simply use religious terms, you might say, in conversation, and certainly in actions by our our kindness, our willingness to put someone else first at a doorway or in traffic or whatever it might be, uh, someone to take time out of our day to help someone because that's what a Christian does. And some of those ways, I think, is where we model and share our faith. And finally, I think we need to practice the corporal works of mercy uh, with great intentionality. Uh, the greatest sign of Christ in the world isn't going to be words, it's going to be actions. And the more we can be a, a witness of Christ's presence in the world, more than all our talk is, is uh, the power of our actions uh, in convincing others that Christianity is real. So I would suggest some of those things. Thank you, Bishop. You know, hearing you talk, it made me think of St. Therese of Lisieux, who says, 
my joy is to love suffering. <laughs> so, you know, that's how we be can become more joyful is to learn to love the ways that God is asking us to suffer. And even with St. Therese in her little way, just, you know, to choose the little small actions that are going to um, make a big difference um, in that witness. So thank you. Um, Christina, what are some of the things that the church does um, and that's maybe not super helpful and some things that we can do um, to help? Okay, well, thanks for that question. I'm going to kind of answer it wrapped up sort of in, into one, and I'm actually going to pick, piggyback off of uh, a few things that Bishop just mentioned, primarily about witness. Um, when I was reflecting on this question, you know, what popped into my mind was actually thinking about one of my great heroes, I think probably a great hero of many of ours, Pope John Paul, St. Pope John Paul II. And uh, I, I, I think back to um, a really touching moment um, when he first, after he was elected Pope, and he first went back to his, his homeland of Poland for the first time, and he was there for you know, a few days. But this one gathering um, of all of these workers, these people that were super oppressed by the, the state, by the government of the day, um, he said to the crowd, you are not who you say you are. Let me remind you of who you are. And that is just so powerful. I think that that's something we simply need to, to take into our everyday lives as Christians, as Catholics in the world today. I know it's like kind of a mantra for us at the Culture Project. You know, we have a great, our goal is like to restore the culture and all of this. And everyone's like, how are you going to accomplish it? And it's actually not so grand. It's, it's about the simple things. It's about actually every single day making a choice and a decision for me to work on being, starting with myself, it's for me to become and to work on being the best version of myself, to be the most virtuous version of myself. And then not to end there, but to invite people into that life with me, um, to share the cause of my joy, the Lord, um, and why I try to live the way I live. And um, we try to go to the young people in the classrooms and to stop and to say, all this that the world is telling you, that the culture is telling you, all these lies they're whispering in your ears, stop, pause for a moment. You are not who the culture says you are. Let us remind you of who you are. But I think the best way to remind, and this is some of the things that we can all do wrong, and I know I've done this in the past too, it's not about like preaching, like, you know, high and mighty, and like, you're doing this wrong, and you're doing that wrong. It, it goes back to that word witness, I think. Um, and really, how can I live out my faith in a way that is a joyful witness? Um, I think another thing that we do wrong is... Um, you know, and Bishop, again, you touched on this too. It's like, you, it's not like we stay away on the side, isolated where we can be, you know, live in our perfect little communities and live perfect little lives. Um, I think sometimes we think we have to be perfect in order to go out to share the truth or to preach the gospel, but none of us are. So if we're gonna wait till we're perfect, we've missed our chance to preach and to become saints. So we actually miss the opportunity. So I think we need to not be afraid to, as we are, share our life experience and our witness and to not wait to be perfect. Um, but you have to be honest with your mistakes. So this is another thing. Um, sometimes I think we can, we think we have to be perfect. So we don't speak. Or then the other thing is we speak, but we pretend we're actually perfect. And then we actually like have this rigidity, like we're going to be this, you have to live this and do this and do that. And then, and we present this really rigid perfectionistic version of what it means to be religious or spiritual. And guess what? That is not going to work either because you're going to be seen like it's you're, you're eventually it'll show your hypocrisy will come through because we're all basically hypocrites. So I'm not saying be complacent in being a hypocrite and a sinner, not by any means, but I think we just have to be real with who we are, our strengths and our weaknesses and our failures and not be so ashamed or pretend they don't exist, but really, really keep the bar high and striving for virtue and not being afraid to let people into our journey, not scandalously, not sharing things that are inappropriate at the wrong time, but, but not trying to be perfect, um, to be real. Like, let's just be real. And I think when we're real, that authenticity shows through and it's actually attainable. I, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the saints that seem so perfect to me, I have a hard time relating to it. I love hearing about a saint with not just a past, but like 
a, a character struggle or a certain issue or something that goes with them their whole life because I can relate to that. Um, so, I, you know, I try not to pretend to be perfect. I mean, it's a struggle. We all want to be perfect, but I'm not. So why I want to just honest about it, um, but to still keep the standard high and to actually invite others onto the journey with me, the journey of virtue, growing in virtue, the journey of becoming the woman that God created me to become and trying to be a saint, but really in my poor, pathetic way. So I just think we have to be real and honest and invite people in the journey with us and invite them in the conversation with us and uh, just do something, just get, get started. And um, isolationism too, real quick, is a huge issue of today. And so let's build community where we can just to come together and to build community because in that isolationism, all of these ugly things thrive. So I guess my takeaways, don't wait till you're perfect because you'll miss your opportunity <laughs> and um, reach out, do something, invite people in the journey, in the honest journey with you of what it means to be a Christian in our crazy world today. Thanks, Christina. And I just want to, I have a follow-up question for you, just like really practically speaking, you know, on Facebook or in a family discussion or whatever it might be, especially now with the heightened political climate. I think it's really easy for maybe opposition or those who aren't Christians or even those some who can, who consider themselves Christians might say that, oh, you pro-lifers are hypocrites. Um, you don't care about life. And so just yet yeah, kind of using your principle there, how would you respond to something like that? Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the, the tough thing today. Um, you know, I think it's, it's more about, you don't want to get defensive um, on these issues. I think a lot, what I try to do in climate like that is to ask more questions. Like, why do you think that? Well, why, why do you think that I only care about, say, the pre-born? Why do you think that I don't care about, you know, my neighbor? And ask questions and actually draw out what is the root. Because a lot of times people, um, when they ask questions like that, Lauren, I don't think a lot of times I don't feel like it's a sincere question. I actually feel like it's coming from a place of like hurt or anger and maybe trying to understand why are these Christians such hypocrites? Why do they just care about, you know, the baby and not the mother, which is not true. Um, a lot of these things are, are false, false thoughts and a false narrative. So I think um, what I've learned is instead of trying to win an argument, so to say on these, these things, so to speak, um, I try to engage in a conversation and a dialogue and to ask questions, to go a little deeper, to kind of get to the root of why do they feel that way? And usually it's, it's a hurt or a suffering or something that they themselves are personally dealing with and they're hurt by. And then maybe we actually get to be the opposite of what we think we will. And maybe we can actually like listen, not be defensive and love them in the place that they're hurt. Cause that's what, they just want to be loved. They just want love. I mean, we all want love. We want to be loved and accepted as we are um, and know that there's a place for us in the world and in the church. So less about winning arguments, more about listening and loving and trying to get to the root. And um, I don't personally just post up, um, everyone has different calls. So I'm not saying if this is what the Lord's asking you to do, do it, do you, you do you. Um, but if I'm not going to have time to have like a real dialogue, I don't do like quick controversial things. <laughs> I try to post uplifting things. And then if someone engages me in a conversation or at the family dinner table or at Thanksgiving or this or that, um, I, I try to avoid the hot buttony stuff and, and to have more of a dialogue. I just, cause I don't find that that's super helpful or productive just in my experience. Thanks. Yeah, I think that, you know, thinking about what wounds or what is behind the, the argument, what's behind these words, it kind of, I mean, it reminds me of how Jesus would encounter people in the Gospels, you know, his apostles, his disciples sometimes would be like, hey, this woman shouldn't be here. Why is she dining with us? And instead, Jesus sees this woman for who she is and why she's washing his feet with her hair, you know, why, why she's there sitting at his feet. And so, that again, Jesus, Jesus as a model for us in times that we could be tempted to be quick to judge or quick to try to just win the argument or say the right thing. And it might be that, you know, it probably is true, especially if we're in line with the church, that our, our understanding is the right understanding of a particular issue. But that doesn't mean that we can just, yeah, try to win an argument. We have to think about the people for who they are. But yeah, those are great, great thoughts. Okay, Kevin, so on to you. Um, what in your, in your mind, what are things that 
well-meaning people like ourselves sometimes do that hurts and what can we be doing um, to help? What can we be doing to redeem the culture? I think taking a moment to pause, when we see so many things slipping away and so visibly aware of the pain that exists because, because we care for others, it hurts us when abortions happen, when we see people used or abused and, and so wrongly destroyed and we see that happens because we care for them, there is an anger that can develop or frustration or, and it can quickly, how you respond to that is really important. We started talking earlier, Bishop was, was mentioning the Sermon on the Mount and that goes into Blessed are the Meek. And Fulton Sheen writes about meekness that is often written off as like, oh, that's not very important. But one of the things that is pivotal in what, one of his writings is talking about how meekness is there's righteous anger, not for your pride, but for principles. And so if we are able to, I know, Lauren, you mentioned a a personal attack. Christina, how would you respond to this personal attack? Well, if, if you just take on that and worry about what people are going to think of you, then you're spending time on the wrong focus. Then you've gotten pulled into the perception and, and wrapped into what are people going to think, and then you're more worried about. Then all of a sudden, the suffering the bishop was calling us to do does not sound so attractive. All of a sudden, like this is not going to help. This is not going so well. This hurts. It's really, but if you look towards principle and are able to distinguish there, so I think a very practical thing is, is are you at a point where you're composed to not clinch and defend your faith in such a way that you can't openly share it? Because when you, when, if you want to move to joy and share it with a, a heart of compassion for the person you're speaking to, you can't look at that person as the enemy. You can't view someone who disagrees with you with hatred but you have to view them with a compassion and a heart that wants to reach in and reach into their heart and move them forward. So practical, a couple of practical things we do is, is form students to dialogue with dignity, where you have to dialogue, like the dignity you are standing for, yes, for the unborn, for their mothers, for their fathers, or whatever segment of the family, the human family you are standing for that we have left outside of the circle of value, you have to be able to also value the person in front of you and value yourself. So if you find yourself screaming, clinched mad, if you find yourself like shaking because you're so nervous and, and those emotional things, the physical things that signs are telling you, hey, maybe you need to step back from this conversation to the point where then you can engage in a joyful way. I'm not saying downplay the, the valid, valid important truth of it, but if you're delivering it in such a combative way, the person is not gonna receive it. And this has, if this is about us, it's not about our stand and our being right. It is about helping reach the person in front of you. On the other side, you also have to dignify yourself and not, not to be a doormat. You're not to be walked on, trampled and disvalued. And so many students say, well, if I have a faith and they know that part, then they're just gonna disregard who I am. So that doesn't stop you from the call to proclaim what you've been taught and learned. It just means, okay, it may not go so well. Okay, yes, you'll be rejected. I'm pretty sure the models of faith that we have seen have been rejected lots of times. But if we carry that ourselves and our pride, then that's gonna be too much. But if we were not doing it for ourselves, then it doesn't matter how many times we're rejected. We develop a tolerance and a, a, a firmness and maybe not so much of a softness anymore, but an ability to respond to adversity that is not about just winning that moment, but our eyes are set so much beyond. I think so dialogue with dignity is something that we send people out on a framework of thought, and we also call them to dare greatly. And by that, that means right now in the virtual world, you can call up a friend I, and have a conversation. Hey, what do you think about this? Where do you stand? Are you, are you more pro-life, pro-choice? Instead of waiting for, so someone says, well, I'll be ready to speak once the moment arises. Like, Whoa, that's, that's not like, we can't sit back and say, oh yeah, our mission to, to proclaim, once someone asks us to, then I'm on the hook and I have to say, say what my values are. It's like, no, how do you go out from within and do so? And a quick tidbit on that, and then I'll, I'll stop rant. I, I love this because our students engage and live it out so visibly, and that authenticity is attractive. And, and it draws other people's in. One, 
one of the students recently was telling me about car. Heather was at a bar and, and this guy approached her and it was Saturday night and he said, oh, hey, what are you guys doing later tonight? And Heather said, nothing, it's getting late. I'm gonna go to bed. He's like, oh, I thought you were someone who valued having fun and I thought this was gonna be great. What are you doing? She's like, no, I'm waking up tomorrow for church. It's, gonna, it's Sunday morning. And the guy started with this condescending approach of like, oh, how dare you? Uh, like, what are you thinking? And just disregarding what she said. But instead of getting defensive or like feeling ashamed or anything like that, she just responded, oh, I love Jesus. I can't wait to go to church tomorrow. And it was her joy that he left confused. And I think that's a great point. If your joy for what you're doing confuses people, you're starting them on that process of a cognitive change. Yes, our lives can be a little confusing to people, I think. <laughs> um, well, we are about at our time here. So thank you so much to our panelists for this awesome discussion. Um, some really helpful thoughts, why the culture is where it is, and you know, just some practical things that we as the church can do um, to move forward to help redeem the time to be Jesus's hands and feet. Um, I just want to thank our panelists, Bishop Joseph Hannafelt from the Diocese of Grand Island, one of our wonderful bishops that we serve here in the Nebraska Catholic Conference. If you haven't seen his recent article for Respect Life Month, um, go and find it. It's on the Grand Island Diocese website. Also, the Nebraska Catholic Conference has shared it. Awesome reflections about the pro-life cause and all of the other things that we should be thinking about this month. Um, thank you, Bishop, for your witness on that. It was really awesome. Um, again, Christina Barba Whalen, she is the director of the Culture Project. You can find them on just about any social media, and they have an awesome website. They make very beautiful content and true, very good and true and beautiful content, um, especially targeting young people. So if you have young people in your lives that you want to hear good messages, the Culture Project is there. And then again, Kevin Grillo from We Dignify, another group that works with young people, with college students, building up pro-life leaders. Um, you can find their website and on Facebook as well. So We Dignify and The Culture Project. Thank you so much to our panelists. We're going to start our keynote address here in a few minutes. We'll have a couple minutes just to wait for some people to log on um, to hear George Weigel. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> we'll just give a few minutes. George, I see that you're with us, so thank you for joining us today. <laughs> we'll just let a few more people log on before we give that talk. Thank you. <laughs>